Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. There are two basic interpretations of this amendment. One, the collectivist view, that the Second Amendment protects only the right of the people collectively to bear arms through a state police force. Now, as to that view, I can only say, what if we applied the same principle to the First Amendment? What if we were to say that the First Amendment guarantee of a free press only protects the right of the state to maintain a state newspaper? If I said that, I'd be laughed out of every constitutional law circle in the country. Why apply that kind of interpretation to the second? The whole idea of the Bill of Rights is the protection of individuals. If the Second Amendment only protects the right of the state to have a state police force, it is entirely out of place in the Bill of Rights. Not only that, but that view doesn't seem to really have occurred seriously to anybody until the late 1800s to early 1900s. Then we have the individualist view that the Second Amendment protects the right of the individual to keep and bear arms and mentions the militia only as a reason for this right. Militia was not just a National Guard. Rather, the militia consisted of all able-bodied male citizens at that time. And they were expected to own firearms, to know how to use them, and to bring them with them when they reported for militia duty. In fact, from the days of Alfred the Great, way back in AD 871 to 899, the English law, way back in those days, required all able-bodied men to purchase weapons and to be available for military duty. Several statements by leading framers as to their view of the First Amendment. George Washington, firearms stand next in importance to the Constitution itself. They are the American people's liberty teeth and keystone under independence. To secure peace, security, and happiness, the rifle and the pistol are equally indispensable. The very atmosphere of firearms everywhere restrains evil interference. They deserve a place of honor with all that is good. Samuel Adams, who many call the father of the American Revolution, the Constitution shall never be construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. Thomas Jefferson said, no free men shall ever be debarred the use of arms. Noah Webster, who did a lot to systematize our language with his 1828 dictionary, but in 1787, Noah Webster stated, before a standing army or a tyrannical government can rule, the people must be disarmed, as they are in almost every kingdom in Europe. An armed citizenry was thought by the founding fathers to be a defense against not only foreign invasion, but also against domestic tyranny. And for that reason, they supported the individual's right to bear arms. The Third Amendment doesn't need a great deal of discussion. It simply relates to the provision about quartering troops. They recognized the military necessity of quartering troops in private homes from time to time, but they objected to the British policy of doing so. And they insisted that it had to be done only in wartime, and even then, in a manner prescribed by law, unless we had the consent of the owner. The Fourth Amendment speaks about the right to be protected from unreasonable search and seizure. The key word is unreasonable. It doesn't forbid all searches and seizures. It only prohibits those that are unreasonable. And how to define that is what most Fourth Amendment case law is about. Normally, to be reasonable, a search must be accompanied by a search warrant and be supported by probable cause that probable cause has to be set forth in an affidavit, which is presented to, presented to a judge who then signs the search warrant. However, it doesn't say absolutely that there must be a warrant in all cases. In certain circumstances, the requirement of a warrant does not apply, such as a search incident to a lawful arrest. You can't say, now you wait here, I'm going to go down and get a search warrant, don't go away. Or pursuing a fleeing felon or a bona fide emergency or something like this. Also, the courts have said that lesser invasions of privacy, like a frisk of the outer clothing, can be done with some less suspicion, like reasonable and articulable suspicion, rather than full probable cause. It applies in any situation where the individual has a reasonable expectation of privacy.
For example, to telephone conversations, if they're made from a private line at least, to what's going on in the privacy of your home and the like. On the other hand, there are certain areas where you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. If you're growing marijuana on your front lawn and a police officer walks by and sees it, you can't claim that he engaged in an unreasonable search. If you put a marijuana cigarette on the dashboard of your car and a policeman sees it there, well, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy there. On the other hand, if you have it in your glove compartment, that might be different. But there has to be an expectation, reasonable expectation of privacy for the Fourth Amendment to apply. And then we have what we call the exclusionary rule. Now, this rule does not say, it is not found specifically in the Fourth Amendment. You don't see anything in the Fourth Amendment that says, whenever police violate the Fourth Amendment, the evidence may not be used in court. Judges have created that rule. But they created the rule as a means of making sure that policemen do, in fact, respect the Fourth Amendment. And there may be other ways of doing that just as effectively, but that's the means the courts have adopted. This is a limit on the government's authority, then, to intrude in the private lives of individuals. The Fifth Amendment protects personal and property rights, provides that one cannot be tried for a capital or otherwise serious offense unless one has first gone before a grand jury. Well, why do you want a grand jury? Well, the grand jury used to consist of 23 citizens and got that number from Israel. Remember you had the three Sanhedrins in Israel that each had 23 times three, plus the high priest came to the 70 that met as the great Sanhedrin. That's where we got the number of 23 for our grand jury. Basically, the grand jury is a buffer between the individual and the state. You go to trial, and it's going to be traumatic. It's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be expensive, whether you win or lose. And the requirement of a grand jury indictment is simply a requirement that nobody should have to go through that kind of jeopardy and that kind of trauma and expense unless a jury of common people who are not on the state's payroll reach a determination that, yes, there is, in fact, probable cause to go forward with the trial. The Fifth Amendment also pr protects against double jeopardy. That is, you cannot be tried twice by the same jurisdiction for the same offense. And this is to prohibit government harassment of an individual. It used to happen in England sometimes that one person might be acquitted and then tried with the same charge for the same offense over and over again until Finally, they found a jury that would convict, or finally the person agreed to plead just because he was tired of fighting it. That wasn't going to be done here. Then there was a prohibition against compulsory self-incrimination. One reason for this is that a coerced confession might be false. You might be confessing just to stop the torture, when really you didn't do it at all. Another is that it violates basic human dignity by forcing people to cooperate in their own self-destruction. Courts have also ruled recently in the Miranda decision that any time somebody is in custody and is being interrogated as a suspect, that situation is inherently coercive. And therefore, to make sure that if the person waives his right to remain silent, to make sure that is truly a voluntary and intelligent waiver, he must be read the Miranda warnings. That's the basis of the Miranda decision back around 1964. The Fifth Amendment goes on to say that no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And due process simply means procedures that are essential for fundamental fairness. And that we cannot take private property for public use without just compensation. But one of the real questions there is, what is a taking? If, for example, the government starts imposing regulations like saying you can't build on this land anymore because we decided this land is going to be a wildlife sanctuary or something, or you can't make any improvements on this church building because we've decided that this church building is a historical site, have they, in effect, taken your property when they have effectively deprived you of much of the use of it? Those questions are being litigated by the courts today. The Sixth Amendment deals with the rights of criminal defendants provides for the right of a speedy trial, but what is speedy depends on all circumstances, like reasons for the delay and whether the defendant's in custody and the like. Provides that the trial is to be public. Now, a lot of us wouldn't want a public trial. We don't want our names dragged through the newspapers and so on. And yet, trials are less likely to be unfair 
if there is public scrutiny than if we have star chamber proceedings where things are being done in private. You have the right to be tried by a jury of the state and district where the crime is alleged to be committed, to be informed of the charges against you with sufficient detail so that you can formulate a defense, and an opportunity to confront and cross-examine your accusers, to subpoena, that is, compel people who can get evidence in your favor to come in and testify, and you're entitled to the assistance of counsel. And as the courts have interpreted that, that means the right to court-appointed counsel if you cannot afford your own, and it means the right to counsel in any case where you face the possibility of any kind of imprisonment. The Seventh Amendment simply deals with rights in civil cases, those involving the right to trial by jury in common law, cases involving more than $20, and no allowance has been made for inflation here. That figure is still $20, as it was in 1789. And that a judge cannot substitute his opinion for that of a jury, unless he determines that the case was erroneously submitted to the jury, so the jury shouldn't have had it to begin with, or that no reasonable jurors could have reached that verdict. The Eighth Amendment protects against various forms of criminal punishment. First of all, provides against excessive bail. The idea that to, with bail, the purpose of bail is not to punish. The purpose of bail is simply to ensure that the defendant is going to appear for his trial. And remember, all this time that we're waiting for that trial and that defendant may be sitting in jail, he is presumed under the law to be innocent. But given the possibility that he may take off, we impose bail as a means of ensuring that he is going to show up. And so what is excessive bail? Technically, it is one dollar more than is necessary to ensure the defendant's appearance. Well, how do you determine that? Do you ask, well, let's see, Mr. Defendant, you're charged with armed robbery. If we set bail at $10,000, would you show up? No, at $10,000, I'd probably skip. Okay, how about if we set it at 20000 No, if you set it at 20000 I'd probably show up. Okay, 20000 no. You can't do that, obviously, so you look at all facts and circumstances, like the nature of the offense, whether or not the defendant lives in the community, what ties he has here, and so on. You can argue that either way as a defense attorney. If your client has a clean record, you say, look, Your Honor, my client has never been arrested, perfect record before. If you're in the opposite situation, you might say, look at my client's perfect record, 79 arrests, and he made every court appearance. So it can work both ways. No excessive fines. Now, excessive is that which is unreasonable considering the nature of the offense. The Magna Carta, for example, speaks about excessive fines as those which have the effect of taking away the individual's means of making a livelihood, his basic tools, and so on. The amendment also prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And the framers used this to prohibit unreasonable torture, like disemboweling and mutilation and things like this. They would not have considered capital punishment cruel and unusual, although several justices recently have argued that with an evolving interpretation, that's the interpretation that should be given to it today. We'll talk more about that in Lecture 11. The Ninth Amendment is Madison's answer to Hamilton's objection. Remember, Hamilton was concerned that if we start naming rights, what happens to the ones we don't name? Well, that's why Madison said in the Ninth Amendment, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, just because we've named some doesn't mean we've forfeited the rights that we haven't named. Now, I think a key word here is retained. I remember one time when I was speaking in, at a university in North Dakota, a political science professor asked me, about the Supreme Court's power to create new rights, like the right to abortion and the right to engage in sodomy and so on. And he said, doesn't the Ninth Amendment give the court some breathing room in this area? Well, my answer was that the key word here has to be retained. If the Ninth Amendment had spoken about rights acquired by the people, then maybe that would give the court some latitude to recognize and create new rights. But when it says, only rights retained by the people. Obviously, the only rights that the framers thought they were protecting by the Ninth Amendment were rights that were already recognized and protected under then existing English and American common law. The Tenth Amendment is an amendment that I would describe as a cornerstone of freedom. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Once again, the idea that the federal government has only such power as we, the people, have delegated to it. Whatever we haven't delegated, 
we have reserved to the states or to ourselves. A cornerstone of freedom, but one which is largely ignored today. The 11th Amendment, adopted in 1798, was a reaction against a Supreme Court decision that allowed a citizen of another state to sue Georgia. And the reaction against that generated the 11th Amendment, which said that no state could be sued in federal court by citizens of another jurisdiction without that state's consent. Once again, you see the expansion of the power of the state here. The state now can get by with torts or contract breaches and the like, and is not answerable for what it does, unless it decides, the state decides it's going to be answered. The doctrine of sovereign immunity being erected here. Twelfth Amendment, simply modifying the Electoral College, we've already talked about that. The Thirteenth Amendment abolishes the institution of slavery, or as it calls it, involuntary servitude. On its face, it doesn't say anything about segregation. But in several decisions, particularly the civil rights cases, it's a conglomerate of several cases decided together in 1883, Justice John Marshall Harlan dissented. And he argued that the 13th Amendment does more than just simply remove the shackles and say that you can't keep people in the cotton plantations anymore. Rather, it abolishes also what Harlan calls the badges and incidents of slavery. That is, those conditions that are reminiscent of slavery, like not being allowed to make contracts, or not being allowed to ride the same bus, or not being allowed to live in the same neighborhoods. That was the dissenting view at that time, but by 1968, that had become a majority view interpretation of the 13th Amendment. Now notice this phrase in section four, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. In many of these amendments, we see phrases like this, the 14th, the 15th, the 18th, the 19th, 23rd, 24th, and 26th. In each of these, we see these being used as a great expanse of federal power. Let's look at the 14th Amendment, the most important amendment since the Bill of Rights. First of all, it simply says that states must respect the rights of all U.S. citizens. Then it says that no state may deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, the Fifth Amendment, you recall, had a similar phrase, but the Fifth Amendment, like the rest of the Bill of Rights, applied only to the federal government. Here, we are now talking about the states. Now we're saying states cannot deprive people of life, liberty, or property without due process. Well, what does liberty and due process mean? Well, the courts gradually came to an interpretation to say that liberty means more than just not being in jail. Liberty means the basic rights that we hold as citizens, the right to free speech, to free press, to freedom of religion, the right to own property, to travel where you wish, and so on. It means the liberty not to have your rights violated without a fair trial and the right to counsel and these things. In other words, the court said liberty and due process essentially mean the rights that we see in the Bill of Rights. And so the doctrine of incorporation was developed by the courts in the early 1900s. And this doctrine essentially says that the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause takes the Bill of Rights, incorporates the Bill of Rights into the 14th Amendment, and thereby applies the Bill of Rights to the states. Now, whether that's what the framers of the 14th Amendment actually intended by it is open to serious question. In fact, I'd say I think it is doubtful. But that is the position the courts have taken today. As a result, local school boards, City councils, county commissions, which are simply subdivisions of state government, are just as much prohibited by the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment and the rest of the Bill of Rights as is the federal government itself. And one of the results of this, then, has been an explosion of federal litigation over Bill of Rights constitutional issues. And commonly, when you sue for a violation of your First Amendment rights, you will say First and Fourteenth Amendment because you're arguing this doctrine of incorporation. The Fourteenth Amendment went on to say that those who aided the Confederacy may not vote or hold office unless they were pardoned by Congress. 
And then goes on to say in Section 7 that debts owed to Union soldiers are valid, but debts owed to Confederate soldiers are not. The 15th Amendment provided voting rights for former slaves, saying that people may not be deprived of the right to vote because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now notice in both of these amendments, we see these amendments closing with the phrase, Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Now time and again, we have seen the courts use this as expanding federal power. This recent legislation, freedom of access to abortion clinics, what business does the federal government have regulating abortion clinics? That is a matter that should be handled by the states. Well, the answer that they give is right here in the 14th Amendment. You see, they argue that abortion is a basic liberty right under the 14th Amendment. Congress has the right to enforce that right by appropriate legislation, and so this freedom of access to abortion clinics legislation is a means of enforcing this right to abortion. You see how the Congress and the courts have used these amendments as a means of expanding federal power into many, many areas that were traditionally thought to belong to the states. The 16th Amendment then pertains to income tax. 1913 Amendment, prior to that time, we didn't have an income tax. Congress passed one in 1893, but the Supreme Court ruled it was unconstitutional. And so then Congress passed the 16th Amendment in 1909 and was ratified in 1913. It was understood, though, to be a very limited tax. In fact, if you take a look at the tax form, the 1040 from 1913, the first 1040 ever issued, we find that the standard deduction was $4,000. Now, that translates into about $60,000 in today's income. In other words, if you were making $60,000 or less, forget it. Everything was under the standard deduction, and you didn't owe any tax. If you made the equivalent of today's 60000 or more, then everything above that, you would pay 1% on the first $20,000 of your income. Now, $20,000 of income at that time would be close to about 300000 a day. In other words, your first 60000 if you're using today's money, your first 60000 is exempt, and... Then the remaining 240000 you pay 1%. Now, on everything above that, if you're very wealthy, you pay what we call a super tax. And this is a graduated tax. And if you made $500,000 or more, which would be the equivalent of about $7.5 million today, then your super tax would be 6%. Well, the enormous growth of the federal income tax itself is just one measure of the growing influence of the federal government upon our lives. The 17th Amendment, 1915, provides that senators are popularly elected, which also means that the Senate is now very di little different in character from the House, and also means that the state legislatures, which had previously appointed the senators, no longer have a very important check on what Congress does. The 18th Amendment is a prohibition of alcohol, adopted in 1919, and whether this was a good idea or a bad idea, it does give the federal government authority over a matter of law enforcement that probably was better left to the states. In 1920, we see the Women's Suffrage Amendment. It had already been adopted in several states before that, but now it's mandatory across the nation. The 20th Amendment in 1933 for presidential succession, they alter the system to what we have today, as I've described that. And also, they provide that the president and vice president will take office on the 20th of January instead of the 4th of March, improve transportation and communications. You might not even know by the 20th of January that you've been elected back in 1789, but now with improved communication and transportation, there is no reason to keep a lame duck session of Congress around for that long a period of time. Also, in 1933, we see the adoption of the 21st Amendment, which repeals prohibition. Some say that it simply was unworkable. Others would say that there really had not been any conscientious and vigorous attempt to enforce it. It's one thing to adopt a law and then not enforce it and then say it was unenforceable and repeal it. At any rate, it probably was a good thing to do because, once again, 
the question of regulating alcohol is probably better left to the states. And it does restore to the states the authority to regulate alcohol, which they still may do. The 22nd Amendment then provides for the two-term limit that the framers had originally thought of and changed their minds about. And after Roosevelt died at the beginning of his fourth term, we decided to make it part of our Constitution. The 23rd Amendment provides that the District of Columbia shall have electors in the Electoral College and that these shall be equal to the number of electors from the least populous state. In other words, they get three. One for the equivalent of two senators and one representative, the same as, let's say, like Wyoming or one of the least populous states in the nation. The 24th Amendment provides for an abol abolition of a poll tax. The tax that said that you had to pay a one or two dollar tax in order to vote. Many times it was argued at least that these were just simply a cover to deny people the right to vote. But at any rate, whether they were used to support worthwhile causes, as their supporters said, or whether they were used to, pre to perpetuate segregation, in any event, they were abolished by the poll tax amendment of 1964, the 24th. The 25th Amendment then again provides for some changes in presidential succession. And once again, as we saw earlier, after the offices of president and vice president are both vacant, then Congress will determine who is the successor in that circumstance. And as they've determined it, it'll be the Speaker of the House and then the President pro tem, and then the various cabinet officials in the order of seniority, not of their age or their length of service, but when their department was established. The 26th Amendment provides for the right to vote, and this right may not be denied on the basis of age for anybody who is over 18. Notice this doesn't say that all states have to have 18 as the voting age. It says you can't have it higher than 18. If your state wants to let three-year-olds vote, there's nothing in the Constitution that says they can't lower the right to vote down to age three. Notice, though, that this does show a changing thought about what voting is all about, because voting is now increasingly seen as a universal right rather than as a means of protecting rights and as a privilege to be exercised by those who can vote responsibly. Finally, then, we get to the 27th Amendment, an amendment that provided for congressional pay increases, and we've already discussed that amendment in some detail. This, again, was originally the 11th Amendment proposed by Madison. It was not ratified at that time. What happens when an amendment is sent for ratification? How long do the states have to ratify it? You'll notice the Fifth Amendment itself is silent on that question. Normally, Congress will specify a time limit. Usually, lately, they've specified the time limit as being seven years. In the case of the Bill of Rights, Congress did not set any time limit for ratification. And so the position of the Director of Archives has been that now that 38 plus states have ratified, it is part of the Constitution. And the effect of it is that no congressional pay increase can take effect until after the next election. Now our discussion of the overview of the Constitution is complete. And in the lectures to come, we're going to see how we've moved away from this foundation and what we can do to restore it.